As we pursue our studies in Psalm 119, I now direct your attention to the 16th stanza in the psalm, according to the Hebrew alphabet, the letter Ein. And I read from verses 121 to 128. I have done justice and righteousness. Do not leave me to my oppressors. Be surety for your servant for good. Do not let the proud oppress me. My eyes fail from seeking your salvation and your righteous word. Deal with your servant according to your mercy and teach me your statutes. I am your servant. Give me understanding that I may know your testimonies. It is time for you to act, O Lord, for they have regarded your law as void. Therefore I love your commandments, more than gold, yes, than fine gold. Therefore all your precepts concerning all things I consider right. I hate every false way. To give a title to this section of the psalm, I would choose the pursuit of excellence, the pursuit of excellence. And if there is validity in my hypothesis that Daniel was the author of this psalm, uh, it would fit with the circumstances recorded in uh, Daniel chapter 6, the famous chapter where we're told that under pressure from the conspiracy of his fellow satraps, others in the Babylonian cabinet, we might say, uh, he sought the Lord in a very particular way, uh, kneeling before the Lord three times a day with his windows open toward Jerusalem. He clearly felt under pressure, and therefore he sought the Lord for help and for grace in his situation. And Daniel is described as one of an excellent spirit. That was why the king commended him and wanted him uh, in public office. He was a man of an excellent spirit. And this did not mean, of course, that Daniel considered himself to be sinless, because we know that in his mighty prayer in chapter 9, where he seeks the Lord and asks for mercy uh, upon him uh, and the people in captivity, he included himself when he said, We have sinned. But that said, as a man of God, uh, his life was driven by this pursuit of excellence. I believe that really is an apt description. And what applied to Daniel uh, should apply to you and to me. It should be a characteristic of the Christian that we do indeed pursue excellence. And... Um, these are the features which I believe that emerge out of this psalm. First of all, we will consider uh, excellence before men in public. And secondly, excellence before God in private. And then thirdly, excellence in priorities. Fourth, excellence in our values. And fifth and last, excellence in judgments. Let's begin then with excellence before men. This was undoubtedly a feature of Daniel's public life because he said, I have done justice and righteousness, or I've done judgment with justice. I've always endeavoured to do the right thing. And um, he therefore prays to the Lord, do not leave me to my oppressors. He clearly felt the pressure of his circumstances. And uh, he seemed, humanly speaking, to be quite alone. But he knew he wasn't alone because he was able to turn to the Lord, uh, his God. And uh, what is quite plain here is that he's concerned to pursue excellence uh, in all respects. Clearly, as Matthew Henry points out, for Daniel, honesty was the best policy. Nothing dubious, nothing dodgy nothing questionable. That was the character of Daniel as a public servant uh, in Babylon. And that should be our concern too, shouldn't it? And um, although Daniel was 
being oppressed at this particular time um, he didn't seek revenge and apply to the king against his critics and against his enemies no he was willing to be persecuted rather than a persecutor which is always again a feature of a true Christian and the fact that he says here do not leave me to my oppressors yes he was oppressed his life was a target as far as his enemies were concerned um, he had men who were against him now that does raise a question uh, are we oppressed? are you oppressed? I think it's true to say that um, there's not much of this kind of opposition to Christians in this country so it seems uh, where is oppression? do we tend to take the path of least resistance and uh, keep our noses clean keep our heads below the parapet so we don't um, cause any trouble to ourselves well Daniel stood up and was counted and when we sing that uh, old chorus uh, dare to be a Daniel dare to stand alone uh, how much daring is there in our Christian life that's the big question or are we quite cosy and comfortable not least in this time of the uh, lockdown but we remember the words of the Apostle Paul when he wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3 verse 12 that all those who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution a Christian who has no kind of opposition of any kind it does raise the question how deep is our godliness or is our godliness rather too shallow to invite criticism and um, oppression Jesus did say didn't he that we should let our light so shine before men now do we keep that light switched off or covered or do we let it shine unashamedly for the Lord whose we are and whom we serve or are we prepared to stand openly for the Lord like Daniel did in his public life so that's a challenging question at the very beginning he prays that the Lord will not leave him to his oppressors and then secondly the excellence before God in private excellence before God in private verses 123 to 5 he prays in 122 be surety for your servant for good do not let the proud oppress me my eyes fail from seeking your salvation and your righteous word. Deal with your servant according to your mercy and teach me your statutes. I am your servant. Give me understanding that I may know your testimonies. So what is this? Well, it's the pursuit of excellence before God in private. And uh, when we speak of excellence, we are, of course, not thinking of excellence within ourselves or derived from our own uh, moral endeavours and judgments but no, our excellency is indeed in Christ isn't that what the Apostle Paul said in Philippians chapter 3 where having turned his back on uh, his Jewish pedigree all his qualifications as a moralistic Pharisee trusting in the performance of these to gain acceptance with God and entry into heaven but um, after his conversion he came to realize how empty and how futile these were because he came to discover that he was a sinner and that he needed the grace of God for salvation and therefore he came to understand that in and through the Lord Jesus Christ was alone his salvation and he rejoiced in the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord and he trusted to the excellency which is in the Lord Jesus Christ Daniel here says that God was his surety for salvation and that is what we believe as Christians that there is no guarantee of salvation and acceptance with God in our own strength and endeavours 
but we do know that the Lord Jesus Christ, when we trust in him, he is our surety, he is our guarantee, because he is our saviour, he's died for our sins upon the cross, he's paid the debt that we owed that we could not ever pay, no, the Lord Jesus Christ is the way to the Father, it is through his dying love upon the cross, the righteousness which he earned for us in his sufferings, that's the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ by which, by which we're justified, justified by his blood, as Paul also says in Romans chapter 9, uh, chapter 5 and verse, verse 9. So this is the, the confidence that Paul had. It's the same confidence that Daniel has here uh, as well, both in terms of salvation and also deliverance from these proud oppressors that he was um, being oppressed by so that's the confidence that we have excellence before God we're accepted in Christ before God so all the excellence of our Saviour's ministry for our salvation which was built on the foundation of the excellence of his character demonstrating that he alone was the sinless sin bearer and therefore he was able to make that excellent righteous sacrifice for us upon the cross and uh, we also have the uh, assurance that he will never leave us nor forsake us that he will deliver us and that he will preserve us if not necessarily protect us from the hatred of our oppressors which could lead to our death and in the case of the martyrs has certainly been the case but they were never deserted by the Lord. They were preserved in Christ Jesus and their lives, their salvation were secure in the Lord Jesus Christ. So that is um, Daniel's confidence, Paul's confidence, your confidence, as well as my confidence, um, I trust. Be surety for your servant for good. All goodness is in God. Outside of him there is no goodness. And then he says in verse 123, My eyes fail from seeking your salvation and your righteous word. This would suggest that um, Daniel didn't obtain deliverance and protection in five minutes. Probably there was a time scale in the conspiracy of his enemies against him. Therefore he was having to wait and pray, to pray and to wait until the deliverance would eventually come. And isn't that a feature of true trusting faith, that we must wait God's time and not expect an instant reply, an instant deliverance from the crises that we might be passing through. Patience, therefore. And that uh, always has been a feature hasn't it of the godly life when one thinks of Simeon in the New Testament he had to wait until he was an old old man before the Lord fulfilled his promise that he would see the Lord Christ before he died and then eventually he cuddled him in his arms and said that he was seeing his salvation and likewise the prophet Isaiah at the end of chapter 40 he reminds us that they who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength so when all the pressures are against us, when the problems are there, if we wait on the Lord in true trusting faith, he will not disappoint us, but we must leave the timing, the scheduling, to him and his all-wise uh, purposes. And Daniel is waiting for God's righteous word. And what is the righteous word? Well, fundamentally, it's the word of the gospel, the word which promises righteousness to the unrighteous, the God who promises to forgive and to restore and to renew. That's the promise of God. That's the promise that Daniel was looking to here. My eyes fail from seeking your salvation and your righteous word. As though there were blessings here which were at his moment of praying, uh, still yet future. He had been blessed in many ways. He'd been blessed from his childhood with the knowledge of the things of God, possibly, as I've said earlier, through faithful Jeremiah or some other faithful prophet. 
but he is in need of future blessings now in his present crisis and of course in the future but he's trusting the Lord to make provision for him uh, throughout uh, his life what is very plain to hear that he is completely dependent upon the mercy of God not his own merit this is what I mean um, he was a man of an excellent spirit but not of a sinless spirit because he needed the mercy of God and he trusted in the mercy of God so in 124 he says deal with your servant according to your mercy and that should be true for every Christian it is all about God's mercy not our merit that's the true Bible believing Christian's stance before God we depend upon his mercy not giving us what we deserve on account of our sins but what he's promised according to his mercy in the Lord uh, Jesus Christ this is indeed um, uh, Daniel's confidence at this particular moment in time. And you will notice that he prays, Deal with your righteous servant according to your mercy, and teach me your statutes. He desires to go on being taught. You will notice that he regards himself as a servant, as a servant of the Lord, and servants seek to listen to and obey their masters the Lord is his master Daniel is the servant and so you and I should look upon ourselves in that capacity yes it is a wonderful privilege to be a son or a daughter of God by grace but we should never forget that we're also servants called not only to rejoice in his salvation but for the high privilege of being his servants to serve him in this present world to do his will, to glorify him. That is the calling that we have as, as Christians. And the fact that he recognizes his servanthood, uh, he realizes that he needs continuing direction and guidance and wisdom from above. So he prays, I am your servant. Give me understanding that I may know your testimonies. He wants to trust in God to walk according to his law but always accompanied by the assurance of his mercy. We're back to the Ark of the Covenant again. The demands of the Ten Commandments which we violate in our sin but the provision of mercy, the mercy seat, the propitiation, the great propitiation of the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is that which gives us the assurance the guarantee of our salvation and of our acceptance before God. And then third, excellence in priorities. Excellence in priorities. We read in Psalm 119 here, verse 126, It is time for you to act, O Lord, for they have regarded your law as void. It is time for you to act, O Lord, for they have regarded your law as void void well this really is a, a desperate prayer and we can imagine with those windows open before Jerusalem remember that um, Daniel's enemies the conspirators against him they realized that they could find no complaint about Daniel except they found it with regard to the law of his God they knew that because he was so devoted to God and his law that they could get him on that because they hated Daniel they hated Daniel's God they hated the law of Daniel's God and that seems to be what is alluded to here in this verse it is time for you to act O Lord for they have regarded your law as void and uh, really Daniel is praying here that the Lord would vindicate himself. Of course, Daniel was under attack, but Daniel's chief concern was that his God was under attack. There he was, surrounded by paganism, with all its idolatry, immorality, violence, but Daniel was depending upon the Lord, his God, and he was now praying that God would intervene and that uh, he would act and of course we know 
the story of Daniel 6 and, and the lion's den, we know the happy end of that because King Darius was on his side and um, he was so delighted when the plot to destroy Daniel failed and that the and that the Lord was able to close the mouths of the lions and so uh, Daniel survived and it was his enemies who were torn to pieces by those beasts but the important thing is that uh, Daniel desired that the Lord should be vindicated it's another way of saying that he was pleading with God that he might uh, revive the, the work of godliness within the world uh, it seems to echo the uh, prayer of Isaiah in chapter 64 oh that you would rend the heavens that you would come down that the mountains might shake at your presence to make your name known to your adversaries that the nations may tremble at your presence it's the same basic prayer a prayer that God would be vindicated and that should be our prayer too should it not in our day for like Daniel we too in our secular times we too are surrounded by paganism and immorality political correctness and um, denials of God's law yes these people had made void God's law hasn't our government and our culture certainly within the last 50 years or so made void God's law the fact that um, abortion is legal and the fact that now same sex marriage is legal these are utterly contrary to the law of God our legislators and many are of our elite today they have made void the law of God that's exactly the position that um, Daniel was in and that we certainly uh, are in and this should be our, our longing prayer too let me read you a little extract from Matthew Henry's commentary Daniel's desire it is time for thee O Lord to work to do something for the effectual confutation of atheists and infidels and the silencing of those who set their mouths against the heavens God's time to work is when vice has become most daring and the measure of iniquity is full it is time for thee O Lord to work it is time for everyone in his place to appear on the Lord's side against the threatening growth of profaneness and immorality and also to see to bring about a revival of the Christian faith well Matthew Henry's words they still apply today and that should be our concern as it was Daniel's concern all that time ago of course today the major concern of the economy uh, of the of the nation uh, is the economy they're more concerned about um, materialism material prosperity uh, rather than uh, spiritual values and that's the problem surely that we are that we are in at the uh, at the present time one thinks of our hero Richard Baxter who described the natural man as in the pursuit of prestige pleasure and power the features of the carnal man and uh, these things uh, his triune nature and that is the carnal man's trinity is what uh, Richard Baxter described it and I think it's always been the case apart from the grace of God and certainly this seems to be the kind of ungodly culture that uh, Daniel is fighting against and praying that God would overthrow and that he would vindicate uh, his name uh, we must pray the same as Daniel at the present time surely that is the case which leads us on fourthly to excellence in values excellence in values Therefore I love your commandments more than gold, yes, than fine gold. 
undoubtedly these are the, the values that um, Daniel um, was driven by as Matthew Henry says Daniel loved his Bible more than his money more than his gold and that should be true for us raises the question what do we most value as Christians in this world do we value the word of God because that guarantees to us the truth of God and the grace of God and the life of God do we value the Bible that highly as Daniel did and as Christians down the ages have done uh, that raises that vital personal question uh, what do we love most what do you love most in your life what is most precious to you my dear friend it's quite plain where where Daniel stood what about uh, uh, ourselves what is our treasure more than anything else so there should be these values in our hearts and lives things that we value most of all and where the Lord Jesus Christ is enthroned upon our hearts this will be the case for us we think of our Lord's parable of the rich fool in Luke chapter 12 you'll remember the, the case there if ever there was um, an atheistic materialist it was, it was the rich fool who had no thought of eternity but only of enjoying the present and of feathering his own nest but um, came the warning that uh, one day his life would end and he would lose all he would be taken from from all his treasure was his wealth and the Lord Jesus ended that parable by saying that uh, we must be rich towards God that means the riches of his grace the riches of the salvation which we have in the Lord Jesus Christ because everything else will be taken from us in this world but if we have the Lord Jesus Christ and salvation, then we have the greatest treasure, with Jesus being our chief treasure, when everything else is lost, and that shall preserve us, he shall preserve us, even forever. And uh, this does give us a benchmark for our values, the Lord Jesus Christ leading the way, and then we remember, of course, the words of the Apostle Paul, when he wrote to um, the Philippians and uh, in, in chapter 4 and verse 8 he gives us here something uh, of an agenda for values finally brethren whatever things are true whatever things are noble whatever things are just whatever things are pure whatever things are lovely whatever things are of good report if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy meditate on these things the things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me these do and the God of peace will be with you so those wonderful words provide criteria for our values it's rather striking to remember that um, in the charter of the BBC drawn up at the time when Sir John Reith was the first Director General of the BBC, the words of Philippians 4 8 were enshrined in the Charter. But can we say that the BBC and the whole entertainment industry are they concerned about those virtues? Or has infidelity, profaneness, as Matthew Henry would call it, has pornography and violence and filth of all kinds not taken over? in our whole culture of course that is that is the case but um, for the Christian it will be it will be otherwise we will have these values therefore I love your commandments more than gold yes than fine gold so that's a challenging issue isn't it what do we love most what do we enjoy most when we're by ourselves what do our thoughts drift to? Are they things that fit in with Philippians 4 8 or are they questionable? That's the big question. For Daniel, in his pursuit of excellence, he was single minded in this respect because he loved God and he loved his law. Which brings us fifth and last to 
excellence in judgments excellence in judgments the final verse of the stanza therefore all your precepts concerning all things I consider to be right I hate every false way there's a real black and white statement for you isn't there no sitting on the fence no prevarication no ambiguity about uh, Daniel's attitude and thoughts there and uh, he's very concerned to follow God's precepts that is all the directions all the teachings of his word for our daily lives in godliness uh, he wants to follow them in all things not selectively things that he will approve of and uh, ignore others which are perhaps embarrassing or a little too demanding no he wants to follow God's precepts in all things comprehensive commitment this is consistent commitment this is is that your Christianity is that your commitment my dear friend to the, to the Lord Jesus Christ I allow therefore nothing he says that does not consist with your righteous law therefore all your precepts I consider to be right I hate every false way now of course this is the language of judgment isn't it he may, will make a judgment in this situation in that situation as to what is right and to what is wrong and uh, we have to make judgments don't we and yet when a Christian stands up and expresses a Christian opinion on this that and the other uh, how often the ungodly world will kick back and say you must not be judgmental but on the contrary we must be judgmental and Jesus himself when he said judge not that you be not judged all he's saying in that well known passage is this uh, don't uh, judge others if you aren't prepared to come under the same criteria of judgment yourself he's not saying don't judge but don't judge as if you don't come under the same judgment yourself and uh, on the contrary uh, we should make judgment righteous judgment Jesus says that in John 7 verse 24 very particularly that we must be concerned about making righteous judgment so let's not shield ourselves and avoid making comments and criticisms and issuing bible based opinions because we people might be offended and of course when they say to us you're being judgmental um, they themselves are being judgmental because they, they don't like us in our views and therefore they're being judgmental when they condemn us for being judgmental and what they're really saying is I don't like your judgments well that's alright we don't like their ungodly judgments and we say so but everyone's judgmental the question is the only judgments that are of any value and acceptance before God are those judgments that are based upon his word and that's exactly what Daniel is saying here 